Welcome to the fifth lecture for Regulatory Frameworks for Environmental Management and Planning. In today's lecture, we're leaving the planning framework that we've been looking at in the last three lectures, um, focused on the Sustainable Planning Act, and we are moving on to look at the mining framework in Queensland. We'll also look at environmental impact assessment. Next week, we'll go on to look at coal seam gas. So in today's lecture, I'm following the same structure or similar structure that we've used in previous lectures. We are going to start with a problem and I'm going to talk about the Carmichael coal mine and then go on to look at the question, does the proposed mine comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make it comply? And then within that, we'll unpack that broad question and ask, well, what laws regulate the mine? And we'll see that there's some laws that, other than the Sustainable Planning Act. And then we'll look at different tenures under the Mineral Resources Act, environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act. Also look at coordinated projects because for large projects in Queensland, they typically are made coordinated projects, which gives them the assistance of a state government bureaucrat called the Coordinator General, which is significant for these large projects. Then I'll use this lecture to also talk about environmental impact assessment laws generally. Um, and I'll mention the Regional Planning Interest Act at the end, but that's the, the main bits that I'll talk about. And I'll, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the Carmichael coal mine problem to start with. But as a preliminary topic to this, um, you would have seen in the news that there's massive coral bleaching occurring on the Great Barrier Reef right now. So it's been occurring for the last month, but particularly it's been in the news in the last um, week. Uh, particularly last week there was a 7.30 report, and I just want to play you a bit from it. Severe and extensive coral bleaching on record. A leading coral researcher has just returned from a four-day aerial survey of reefs off Australia's far north coast, and of the 520 reefs his team flew over, all but four were damaged. The extreme bleaching event is likely to kill some of the world's most pristine coral, as Peter McCutcheon reports. This will change the Great Barrier Reef forever. We're seeing huge levels of bleaching in the northern thousand kilometre stretch of the Great Barrier Reef. The sheer scale of coral bleaching is revealed in footage shot for a scientific survey last week. For over a thousand kilometres from Cairns to the Torres Strait, the once colourful ribbons of reef are a ghostly white. Leading this expedition is one of Australia's most eminent coral scientists, Professor Terry Hughes. For me personally, it was devastating to look out of the chopper window and see reef after reef destroyed by bleaching. Um, but really, my emotion is not so much sadness as anger. I'm really angry that the government isn't listening to the evidence that we're providing them since 1998. Terry Hughes and his team rated a staggering 90... I'm going to pause it there. Um, you've probably already seen that on the news. I just wanted to set it as part of the context of this lecture, but it's enormous. It's happening right now, right as we sit here in this lecture um, theatre. We're losing huge chunks of the Great Barrier Reef. And I really think of this quote from Winston Churchill in the context of what's happening right now with the reef and also with government policy on mines and climate change generally. Um, it's a quote from 1936, so in the lead up to World War II, and it was a speech given in Parliament where he was attacking the government of the day for its lack of action um, in addressing the rearmament of Germany. And he said, the government go on in a strange paradox, decided only to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant to drift, solid for fluidity, all-powerful to be impotent. Owing to the past neglect, in the face of the plainest warnings, we have entered a period upon a period of danger, the era of procrastination, of half-measures, 
of soothing and baffling expedience of delays is coming to its close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. We cannot avoid this period. We are in it now. And right now, we are witnessing a major step in the loss of the Great Barrier Reef, like right now. Um, and I'm struck by how it hardly causes a ripple on the news. Um, you know, the news cycle's already moved on to My Kitchen Rules or Renault Rumble or whatever. And our federal environment minister, Greg Hunt, deflects attention by talking about this bleaching event and talks about El Nino without mentioning climate change. And this is a quote from Greg Hunt um, a week or so, on 21st of March. Mr Hunt said it, the bleaching on the GBR, was not as bad as, it, as first thought. It is not as severe at this stage as 1998 or 2002, which were both El Nino-related events. It is, however, in the northern parts a cause for concern, Mr Hunt said. The reef is 2,300 kilometres long and the bottom three quarters is in a strong condition. But as we head north, it becomes increasingly pr prone to bleaching. Hunt fails to point out that the northern section is also the most pristine. It's where there should be the least bleaching. It's not just as the further north you, north you go, it gets hotter. He doesn't mention climate change. And he's really got a, a track record, a pattern of discounting links between extreme heat events and climate change. Back in 2013, after there'd been intense bushfires in New South Wales in October, Blue Mountains, you might remember, was ablaze. It was a really early fire season, extreme temperatures and extreme fire events. And um, Greg Hunt was quoted as having looked up on Wikipedia um, that there wasn't a strong link between climate change and increased bushfire intensity, which is incredible for, uh, you know, a minister with hundreds of staff with PhDs and masters and, you know, climate change department he could consult. No, he goes and looks it up on Wikipedia. So that's context for um, Adani gaining the final major approval it needs from the government for the massive Carmichael coal mine. So you might have seen that in the news on Sunday. The Queensland Premier announced that the mining lease had been granted for this massive mine, and you might have seen some protests about it as well. So this is a screen grab from the Financial Review on the 3rd of April, so just a few days ago. Now, I've got difficulty in talking about this mine. I've been involved in a series of court cases about it. I've got difficulty both because of the enormous amount of information that I could potentially put into this lecture, and I'm going to try and keep it um, reasonable um, and manageable, but I also struggle with this emotionally because I really feel numb by the approval of this massive mine in the midst of the loss of the Great Barrier Reef that's happening right before us, right now. And really, for me, it highlights the systemic failure of our governments uh, and the legal system to protect us. So let's look at the Carmichael coal mine. It's a massive mine that's proposed for central Queensland, inland from Mackay. So if we look at a map, you can see Mackay there on the east coast. You go inland, you can see the project marked. Um, the project's actually proposing to take the coal out by a new rail line um, out at Abbott Point, um, which is just near Bowen. So the project, if we focus in on it, um, is shown in pink purple there. That's the mining lease area. And um, on this image, there's the um, current pasture leases that are in the area. So Dungabulla is a big pasture lease um, to the west. There's Carmichael. Um, Moray Downs is the pasture lease that it's mainly on. There's Lingnab, Lingnam and Melaleuca to the south. Um, the Carmichael River passes through the mine site and just to the west of it, there's a big springs complex that I'll talk about in a moment, the Dungabulla Springs Complex, which is groundwater fed. So if we focus in on the mine layout plan, this mine is enormous. It's about 20, this image that I've shown you is about 20 kilometres across by about 30 kilometres north to south. Um, there's the pits within it um, will be like four kilometres by four kilometres across. So there's pit pits A through to P. Um, so the green stippled squares are the open cut pits and the um, what look like louvers or something here, that, that's underground um, mining in, in that area. The coal seams dip 
um, from east to west, they go deeper. So they start with open cut on the eastern side, and then once it gets too deep to be economically viable, they go underground. So here's an open cut concept. You know, you strip away the whole overburden. Um, so if you look at this bottom one here, you've got a big drag line. There's, you take away the overburden, and you dig down to the coal seams. And this is an example of an open cut mine uh, in the Bowen Basin. So you can see the overburden up here, and they've gotten right down to the coal seams. <coughs> This is another example from a mine in the Galilee Basin or an, uh, a, a test pit for a mine in the Galilee Basin called the Alpha Mine. And you can clearly see here the overburden and then the coal seams in black. Okay, so once you go underground, you don't need to take off the overburden, but basically you go along and um, long wall mining, which is what's proposed, basically moves along and takes out the coal and then the ground collapses beneath it. So there's subsidence um, of the ground above. So there's a drop of um, six to six meters or so, um, because that's essentially the coal seam that they're taking out. Now, once they've got the coal out of the ground, it's then trans proposed to be transported by a massive new rail line to the coast. And the rail line is one of the big difficulties for the project because it's very expensive and capital intensive to build. And you've got to put that in up front. Um, once it gets to the coast, uh, it's going to Abbott Point. So this is the current coal loading facility at Abbott Point. It's massive already. The coal is deposited from um, the trains in the stockpile and then goes out on a conveyor belt out to the deeper water where the um, berths are for the ships and then loaded onto ships. Now, because of the massive increases in coal that were proposed about five years ago, there, was, there were a number of proposals to expand the um, at the point. Um, so currently there's one terminal T1, there was a proposal for a multi-cargo facility, um, and then there are proposals for other different um, terminals. T0 is the Adani one. Most of the others have dropped away because the coal market has died, and only Adani is really pushing ahead with a proposal to expand at the point. It's having a lot of troubles with both the dredging for it, but also where you get rid of the dredged spoil for that terminal, and whether it, uh, it was originally proposed to dump it in the Grab Barrier Reef, ultimately that was junked, and it's proposed to dispose of it um, on land or for reclamation. Now, the enormous scale of coal mines is really difficult to understand, um, especially the new mega mines like Carmichael. So this mine, as I said, was about 20 kilometres across, 25 kilometres across, and about 30 kilometres north to south. To give you some idea of the scale of that, so you know, University of Queensland is one kilometre across. If you took a four by four square, then you would take out the whole of St Lucia over to pretty well the Gabba, all of West End, the CBD, Orkinflower, Toowong. Imagine digging that area and going down like 100 150 metres. So that would be an enormous hole. Who lives in that square? I live in that square. So we're all 100 metres underground. And if you took the whole of the pits, they're about 8 kilometres wide by about 32 kilometres long, you'd have an area, that a pit, that would stretch from UQ to Redcliffe. 8 kilometres across, 100 metres deep absolutely enormous. And um, I'm just going to stretch the mine across Brisbane just to show you that was obviously a block. But if you just take, I've just got a scale there of four kilometres and stretch the actual mine layout across it, it would stretch basically from Logan home all the way through to Chermside. So basically all through Brisbane, pretty well you take out a million people in that area. So who lives in that mine area? If, if, um, yep, so pretty well everyone here is going to live in that footprint. Absolutely enormous amount of dirt that is going to be moved. Apart from the coal that is going to be pulled out of the ground, the overburden that actually gets moved for this mine is phenomenal. It is virtually incomprehensible how big the hole is. Now, I want to talk about the impacts. So I'm going to focus on three things. Um, groundwater, um, a bird species, an endangered bird species that's on the mine site, and also climate change. So let's talk about groundwater. Um, 
the groundwater impacts of, of, for this mine really focus on Dugmabula Springs, which are off to the west of the mine site. Um, so the mustard there, the mustard shape is the mine mining lease area. The pink are other mining mine proposals or exploration permits. So Dugmabula Springs um, is east, and it's not actually on the mining lease area. But because of the way the groundwater flows, um, there's a real concern that Dungabula Springs will be heavily impacted. So um, if you focus in, um, the Dungabula Springs is a complex of groundwater springs, there's about 60 of them, and they're scattered around the Carmichael River, but they're not associated with surface flow. It's water that's coming up from the ground, has been for tens of thousands of, tens of, thousands of years. Um, If we have a look at some of the springs, this is um, a screenshot from a video I'm going to show you from Moses Three Lagoon. The big lake that you can see in the foreground is both fed by groundwater and surface water, but it looks spectacular. But actually the outlet for the groundwater springs is over here, this big bunch of trees. So this is some footage from a drone flying up over that lake and you can see the, the lake in the middle of that screen. You can see the outlet for the springs in the distance coming into view now. And the outlet footage is having a bit of difficulty playing but you can get the basic idea. Can you see that the big outlet, bright green, so water has been flowing out at exactly that point for tens of thousands of years. You can, if you walk in there, and I've walked into it a couple of times, there's these big melaleuca trees, and um, it's not actually the melaleucas and the trees that are the really exciting thing from an ecological perspective, it's actually a lot of the grasses and sedges um, that are growing around the base of the um, trees that are really exciting from an ecological perspective because they're endemic to groundwater springs. They're um, found nowhere else, obviously, and, um, and they have been heavily impacted by development of springs around um, Queensland. So this is one of the jewels in the crown of groundwater springs in Queensland. So this is just a picture of Moses Three Lagoon. Um, yeah, heaps of bird life there. Like, so I've been there a couple of times. Huge number of birds. Yeah, lots of stuff going on there. Permanent water. So in central Queensland, that's you know um, more valuable than gold and diamonds and everything else you could throw at it, particularly from an ecological perspective. So this is another of the springs, which is just a little way away. Um, this one looks much like a big um, golf course, more than the, there's no big trees growing on it. Again, water has been coming up here for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. And this is um, another bit of drone imagery that will rise up and then look over um, what's called Moses One um, Lagoon. So it turns around and it'll follow the creek around. And what I want you to notice is in the distance how dry it is. So it's all cattle country. It's a, it's a working cattle property, but cattle haven't impacted heavily on the springs. They don't really walk into the springs. Um, and these springs aren't heavily impacted by weeds, amazingly. And this swings back, that's the Moses One Lagoon directly down. You can see how different it is to what's in the distance. So, and you can see um, the other Moses, um, the imagery I just showed you just in the distance. So these are really amazing springs. This is another one, Little Moses Spring. This one's quite different, it's to the east. It's quite heavily impacted by weeds. Um, it's quite a different nature to the others. And then there's Joshua Spring, which is an artesian spring that flows without pumping out of the ground. Now, farmers decades ago have built a dam around the spring, so it would have flowed out to the ground before and back down the Carmichael River. But they built a dam around it, and this is now an outlet coming out from the dam that's just been, um, the water's just flowing out. But there's nothing pumping that. You can see the solar panels in the background, but that's not associated with a pump for the water coming out of the ground. So water's just rising up out of the ground and coming out at a phenomenal rate. Um, 
And so an artesian spring occurs where you have water being recharged, um, getting into a groundwater system, and then a confining layer that stops the water getting back out. And then the water is, flows to a point, and then if you put a well down to that water and your groundwater level is lower than the hydraulic head in the recharge area, water will flow out of a well. Or alternatively, alternative, alternatively, if it's a natural artesian spring, a fault is typically what causes basically a break through a confining layer uh, get, and allows the water to get to the surface. But it's the hydraulic head from the recharge area that drives the water out of the ground. So in the assessment of this mine, a critical issue was whether the source of the springs is from above or beneath a regional aquitar, so a confining layer, called the Rewind Formation. And one thing that Adani, the mining company, claimed was that there's no evidence of any faulting in the area of the Dungabula Springs, but, <laughs> it's a significant but, they actually didn't do any testing, drilling, seismic testing for faults in the area around Dungabula Springs specifically. They did a lot on their mine site because faults are really significant if you're planning to construct a big mine. And on their mine site, this is some of the seismic data, the red line is a fault and it actually goes from 550 metres depth through to about 200, met 200 metres beneath the surface of the ground. So that's a fault running hundreds of metres um, the black lines here are the coal seams and the rewind formation is directly above it. So you've got a fault going through the rewind formation on their mine site to the east, but their claim was, hey, no evidence of faulting at the springs itself. But it's very much a false claim because, well, it's true but misleading because there was the, they hadn't done any testing for faulting, so um, saying there's no evidence is like claiming that, uh, well, think of a appropriate analogy, but you get the idea, you've got faulting on the mine site that goes all the way through the rewind formation. It's a logical inference that there may well be faulting going through the rewind formation at the springs, and that would be a logical source for the springs. Um, in the approval process, ultimately um, the government decided that it couldn't really work out where the springs were. The federal minister came up with a fantastic idea of doing a study for the source or the Rewan Formation Conductivity Research Plan. This is in the federal approval for the mine. And basically there has to be, it wasn't done before in terms of the assessment of the mine. The minister says there must be a plan to assess the connectivity across the Rewan and it must be, the plan must be submitted three months before mining commences. But no actual, you don't actually have to have the results. So they haven't done the testing for the faulting and they're allowed to get the approval and do the testing in the future. And if the mine does basically, if the, there is a fault that allows the groundwater is coming from beneath the Rewan, then that's where the mine is going to dewater because that's where the coal seams are. <coughs> and so basically the Dumbawula Springs will just stop. Stop, end of story, can't be restarted, faults will likely close, you can't restart it, completely stuffed. So groundwater springs that have been there for tens of thousands of years, gone, overnight. And yeah, get the, the logic of assess whether they're there after you've given the approval. Okay, in terms of threatened species, um, it just gets better um, because um, cause this mine ticks boxes for every conceivable big picture thing that you could have. So apart from these amazing springs complexes with all these endemic species that may well be just wiped out completely, um, on the mine site itself, where they plan to mine, the habitat looks like this. I've just got some imagery from one of the parts of the um, EIS. And um, it doesn't look like much, does it? You know, cattle property you know, looks fairly impacted. Um, we were, these pictures are taken in a fairly dry time. It's often really dry. But on that, um, in that area, there's this amazing little bird called the black-throated finch. Um, this is an, an image of it. Um, and you can see how big they are. This is a picture, you can see the size of the hand. So if you hold up your hand and you imagine a little finch on your fingers, it'd just be, you know, basically the size of your fingers. 
So a really cool little bird. This is also a close-up. You can see the finger just underneath it where the, on the picture. So they're not really as ginormous as it might appear from that picture. Okay, this is a picture taken where the mine is going to go. Um, it was a, it's a picture with 124 black-throated finches in it, part of a flock of at least 400 black-throated finches, which were observed by a PhD student who Adani let onto the property. Now they hadn't been finding many, they had not been finding many black-throated finches on the property, and he just happened to wander across a flock of 400, which is the largest flock of these birds ever observed, ever. Well, of course I'm referring to um, post-European invasion and what we record in pictures. Um, I'm sure that pre-invasion um, and Aboriginal people have observed larger flocks, but in terms of um, records, um, photographic records, um, this is the largest ever. And this is observed in 2013, so not very long ago, in the midst of the approval. Didn't really get much of a mention in the EIS. Um, funnily that, they, they, um, this is part of the um, environmental assessment, the EIS, Environmental Impact Statement for the mine. And basically it turns out, although it wasn't acknowledged in the EIS, but what came out in the court case that I was involved in last year in the land court, what came out was that the population of black-throated finch on the mine site is the largest population left of two. There's another large population west of Townsville, but this is the largest, and this population is critical for the species survival. So basically this um, uh, diagram shows basically the size of populations that were observed. So the big circles represent the big populations. The different colours represent different years. So the red was the um, BTF abundance in 2011, blue is BTF abundance in 2012, and yellow is BTF abundance in 2013. So you can see they're pretty consistently around this northern section, which is basically where a big part of the mine is to go, around a place called um, Ten Mile Bore, which is, I've been there, it's basically just a big bore that's been pumped out so this permanent water. Um, we're not really sure why the black-throated finch is there. We're not really certain about its habitat preferences, why it's there, why it's not in the areas around the mine. So notice that there are some small populations, um, and down here there's a population, but basically they're all within the mine site. Um, interestingly, um, in the EIS, so this middle column is BTF records that were reported by the miner in the environmental impact statement. And notice that there's about a thousand, but no big flocks. During the records that came to light through the court process last year, um, another thousand records were located, including flocks of over 50 and flocks of over 100. So notice there's none of that in the actual environmental impact study. Um, now what's proposed, because the mine's going ahead, the government says, you know, you've got to address the impacts on the black-throated finch. So what the miner proposes to do is establish offsets somewhere outside the mine. They haven't actually identified the exact locations yet, but somewhere within these hatched areas, they're going to provide offsets for black-throated finch habitat which would be lost due to the mine. Now you might just remind yourself about how many black-throated finch there are in those areas right now and the fact that we really don't know why they're not there and why they're on the mine site. And then you think, well, what are you going to do in the offset areas? They're not there now. Why would the birds go there? If they're not there now, why would you just assume that what's good on the mine site you can replicate when you don't know why they're on the mine site? And you might think, well, that's kind of a problem for um, offsets that actually make sense. Um, and if you get involved in this sort of process, you realise that offsets don't really have to make a lot of sense. They just have to be there for a veneer of, yes, we're addressing that impact um, and we're going to offset it. So um, it's all smoke and mirrors stuff. Okay, then we get to climate change. You might think, big coal mine, going to be burnt, climate change implications. Um, yes, um, this mine will be the biggest coal mine in Australia, one of the biggest in the world. Absolutely enormous amount of coal that will be pulled out of the ground. 40 to 60 million tonnes of thermal coal per year. 
Um, to give you the context, there's 50 mines in, in Queensland at the moment. Combined, they produce about 200 million tonnes. So this one mine is going to massively increase production from Queensland, which, as you know, Queensland is one of the biggest coal producers in the world. Um, emissions. The, mine, the greenhouse emissions associated with the mining itself, the direct emissions, are very small relatively, only about 2% of the total. Over the 30 to 60 year life of the mine, the coal will produce about 2.3 billion tonnes of thermal coal. When you burn that, you end up with about 4.7 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases. They're called scope three emissions in greenhouse reporting terminology. That's about 98% of the total emissions associated with this mine. And there's a thing called the carbon budget, which is an idea that's been around for the last eight years or so um, from a series of papers in um, um, the journal Nature, and it's been adopted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this idea that to keep global temperature rises beneath two degrees, there is only a certain amount of carbon from fossil fuels that we can emit, because basically once the carbon goes into the atmosphere, it's there basically forever, pretty well a thousand years. Um, so um, once you burn it, it's there forever. So there's a total budget that we've got. This one mine, the coal from it, represent 0.6% of the entire globe's remaining budget forever. Technically up to 2050, but basically forever. So one mine represents 0.6% of the entire globe's emission budget. You might think that that was significant. Um, but in fact, in the EIS process, it pretty well got ignored. For years in Queensland and at a Commonwealth level, we've just had this tacit agreement between government and miners that we ignore the burning of the coal overseas. So if you look at that on a graph, um, we've happily assessed the emissions associated with the mining itself, but that's just this small wedge and ignored, we've ignored the 98% of emissions associated with the burning of the coal. So for, the, in, for this mine, which had a massive EIS, there was no information about the scope three emissions, the emissions from the burning of the coal, wasn't assessed. The Queensland government argues that these emissions are not relevant to the assessment of a mine in Queensland. Um, so the Queensland Department of Environment Heritage Protection will, that's their argument, not relevant, we don't have to consider it because the mine's going to be exported, they'll be burned overseas. You might say to them, well, you know, the globe has one atmosphere, so surely if the coal is going to be burnt, wherever in the world it's burnt, it's going to impact our atmosphere and impact us. So it might be a good idea to think about it. But no, their response is not relevant. So our current approach is pretty well like this. You put your fingers in your ear, you go as loud as you can, la, 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 can't hear you, climate change. Or to put this another way, um, for environmental impact assessment in Queensland for coal mines, it's pretty well like this. We look at groundwater, threatened species and the like, we look at the direct emissions from mining, we ignore the burning of the coal, and it's, yeah, I like this cartoon. The elephant in the room for our coal mines is climate change, but we ignore it. Okay, great question. Um, scope one, two, and three, where does it come from? Why do they ignore it? So um, it comes from an international reporting framework. We'll talk more about it when we talk about climate change in lecture 11, I think. Um, so scope one, um, for about the last decade, um, scope one emissions are emissions directly associated with an activity. So when you turn on your car, you've got your burning fuel, assuming you don't have an electric vehicle, um, you're burning fuel and out of your tailpipe is coming um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions and a few other things. So you have direct greenhouse emissions from your activity. So on a mine site, the diesel going into trucks um, the, uh, and fugitive emissions, so when you rip up the coal, quite a bit of methane comes out of the coal seams, so that's like coal seam gas, but you're not capturing it, so there's a lot of fugitive emissions. So those are direct emissions from the activity, they're called scope one. 
Scope two is emissions associated with your use of electricity generated somewhere else. So in this room, we're using electricity. Let's just assume it's not coming from solar. It's coming from a coal-fired power generator. So the electricity that we're using in this room has scope two emissions, um, but we don't actually see them in this room. And so those are the direct and indirect with an activity. Scope three are indirect, but either upstream or downstream emissions. So um, particularly for a large resources project, you dig up the coal, you sell it, someone else burns it, you can regard that as a scope three emission. It's just an accounting framework. Uh, under the international reporting framework, Australia only reports direct emissions from within Australia. We don't report coal or gas or petroleum that we export to, say, China, which is burned in China. China reports that. So we then use that framework to say, well, we don't have to report scope three emissions or assess them for a coal mine. But the reality is, if you've got an environmental impact assessment of a coal mine, there are going to be these emissions and they will impact the atmosphere. So if you ignore them, it's like you're ignoring the elephant in the room. Cool. Okay, so in terms of the expected condition of the Great Barrier Reef, um, basically we know that the reef has been heavily impacted now. We've got about one degree mean global temperature rise. We're at about 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now. The reef, um, this is from a paper by Ophir Goldberg um, and colleagues from 2007 in the journal Science. They put together three images of what they think coral reefs will look like under different climate scenarios. So on the left is reef as it is now, actually being impacted but still relatively healthy. If we keep going, not very much further, but up to 4, 450 to 500 parts per million CO2, and bear in mind we're at 400 parts per million now and going up by two to three parts per million a year. So we're, you're looking, you know, in your working lives, we'll be at that level on current emission rates. And two degree warming, the reef's pretty well stuffed. Weedy, if you go above three degrees, reef's completely obliterated. So that's what we think will happen to reefs. That's the best science. Um, and yeah, I, I just mentioned now, you, you would have heard a lot about the um, Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement last year about stabilizing temperature rises and a lot of hoo-ha about the two degree target. So basically, I just point out that even if we're successful in stabilizing temperatures beneath two degrees, we won't have a Great Barrier Reef. That's what the science is saying. So don't get too enthusiastic about stabilising beneath two degrees. To me, it's like, yeah, it's a crazy target. But it's internationally that there, there's we're stabilising, aiming to stabilise beneath two degrees or um, at, or beneath 1.5 degrees is a new target that's come in. But even at 1.5, the reef will be heavily impacted. We're seeing it now. We're seeing it at one degree. We've got massive coral bleaching occurring right now. Why would you think that you could double the temperature from what we've got now and it would be okay? Okay, in terms of economics, um, the mine got into at least some public relations bother because when you weigh up, what we see is when you weigh up a big mine like this, there aren't really any specific criteria. It's basically a big weighing up process. So you weigh up, say, if you're going to lose the Dumabula Springs, if you're going to lose a threatened species, if you're going to, you know, cause harm due to climate change, those are all negatives. And then the positive in terms of approving this mine is jobs and money that we get from it. So the economics. So the miner, it's in the miner's interest to inflate those claims, and inflate they did. Um, they were running ads at the last election about how Adani would generate 10,000 jobs and $22 billion in royalties. Um, I point out at the end of the lecture that those turned out to be bunkum. Um, and in the court process last year, their own expert um, walked away from it and said that it was more like 1,400 jobs net across Australia. And um, instead of $22 billion, it was more like 3 to $5 billion in net present value. Now, you might say, well, 1,400 jobs is still significant and $5 billion is still a fair bit of um, royalties. But comparison is what they're claiming and what the, even their own expert agreed to. So, um, and with the economics, I'll leave economics, come back to it, come back to it. 
So, um, people involved, Adani is an Indian um, multinational company. Um, it's the Adani family established it. Putram Adani is the chairman. Um, they're in Australia, Indonesia, but mainly in India. Um, people opposed to it, lots of people opposed to it. You might have been to a rally for it. So this was a group of lawyers and, and um, a conservationist who I worked on the case several cases about it with. So um, you can see me there. This is out of Dungabula Springs. Um, Winita Williams, um, Sean Ryan from the Environmental Defender's Office, Saul Holt, um, QC, an amazing um, silk, um, and Derek Davies here, um, a conservationist who was um, the lead person for organising essentially the objections and running the court case from a conservation sector. You can read about the court case on my website. There's a heaps of documents there um, on groundwater, on uh, climate change. I've put up all of the expert reports, so you'll see that there is an enormous amount of information. Our closing submissions for the Land Court case last year were 210 pages long. So um, a lot of stuff there. I think we're over a thousand footnotes. So basically a PhD in the submissions. Um, and I just wanted to also acknowledge um, the traditional owners and um, I think the best way to do that is actually to just play you a bit of, because I can't do it as well as um, Adrian Burugaba can, but the, can, but the traditional owners have a um, huge concerns about this yep. mine as well. My name is Adrian Burugaba. We're at a crucial time in history now where these great mega mines are coming to us and asking us as the traditional owners of the land to sign away our uh, native title rights and interests to that land. These mines are, are, are very dangerous and they're detrimental to not only just the environment but the, the laws and customs that you know, a, a base in that land that are very important to the Wangan and Jagalingu people. The most important thing is for us to maintain our cultural integrity. Some of these mines will be here right into the future, 40, 50, 60 years from now. We could lose our identity. We're gonna make every effort to stop this mining company from destroying our land. I'm gonna convince all of our people to stand together as one people and one voice and then we're going to ask all Australian people and people from all over the world to stand with us and unite with us to fight this fight. This is not an easy fight for us and we're asking everybody to stand with us to stop these mines from destroying this land. We don't need this coal. We don't need them. We don't need their money. We need them to leave our land alone. We need to protect that land. You know, our forefathers, my father and their grandfather, they had their, their money, they had their wages garnished and money taken off them and so there was no inheritance for us. And all we've got left now is our inheritance is the land. So Adrian Borogaba, amazing fellow. Okay. Um, I want to get on to talking about legislation, but just before I do that, I just want to mention the context of this mine in the Queensland coal industry, because if you're going to work in this sector, you need to know basically things like the big basins where they are. So coal, if you break it up, it looks like a black rock. Um, in coal seams, which is what you mainly mining, um, they can be massive, metres thick. So as I said before, this is a, um, a pit um, in a test pit for another mine in the Galilee called the Alpha Coal Mine. You can see the overburden and the coal seams. There are actually two coal seams there. Um, the white is actually an aquifer um, and the court cases that I was involved in about these, um, there were two mines associated with this pit. Um, the impacts on the aquifer, that aquifer and the one that's basically directly beneath this man's feet um, were a big part of the court case, so groundwater impacts as well. Okay, so Australia, you know, has a lot of coal. Um, Queensland and New South Wales have the most significant um, black coal. So coal comes in different grades um, and ranks. And in Victoria, for instance, in the Latrobe Valley, so down here, um, 
there is uh, a lot of brown coal that's quite close to the surface and in the Latrobe Valley there's a whole series of brown coal fired power generators. Brown coal is basically 50% water, at least in the in the um, Victoria it is. So because it's so much water in it, it's very inefficient. You, when you burn it, you've got to burn off all the water until you basically get some carbon. Um, and because it's so much water, there's, there's no value in transporting it. So basically you have a coal-fired power generator right beside the, the mine and you basically just dig it up, um, put it straight into the furnaces at, on site. So basically Victoria's brown coal is not an export um, quality. Um, in New South Wales, in the Hunter Valley, as you know, and in Queensland, um, we've got a lot of black coal, which is a um, higher grade or higher rank of coal, which has got a lot less water, higher carbon content. And um, particularly in Queensland, we've got a lot of coking coal, which is very good quality coal. Um, so if we focus in on Queensland, there's a number of big mining basins. So um, close to the coast, is the Bowen Basin, which stretches pretty well from Bowen in the north all the way south down to about Gladstone, so seen there in, in blue. And that's where most of our coal mines are because it's close to the coast. It has a lot of coking coal, um, which is used for steel production, higher grade. You get more for it when you sell it. So um, that's the Bowen Basin, and that's been heavily developed. If you work in the mining sector, likely you'll be working in the Bowen Basin. A lot of rail lines are ready to the coast. Um, down to the south, um, we've got the Surratt, but um, particularly um, Ackland and the areas in the Clarence Morton Basin. So does anyone live close to a rail line where coal trains come through in Brisbane? Yep, so I do too. Over, I live over in um, Woolloongabba and we're only 50 metres from a rail line and the coal trains come through in the middle of the night. They're really annoying. Um, and Basically, that coal is coming from the Clarence Morton area, comes through Brisbane and out through the port of Brisbane. But most of the big ports are really Gladstone, um, Hay Point at Mackay and um, Abbott Point. So most of that, all of that's coming from the um, Bowen Basin. Okay, out in the centre of Queensland is a massive coal basin that hasn't been developed uh, as yet. This is the one that's been a huge amount of interest in over the past decade. It's called the Galilee Basin enormous amount of coal. Hasn't been developed for a number of reasons. Lower um, quality coal, so it's mainly coking coal, sorry, mainly steaming or thermal coal used for power generation, but you don't get as much money for it. Um, there's huge amounts of it, but because it's lower quality and because it's so much further from the coast, it's the Bowen Basin that's been developed first and the Galilee Basin just hasn't been developed. So. Um, one of the big impediments to developing it is getting the coal out. So basically that's why a rail line is a big component of these projects. They're enormously expensive to build. So billions and billions of dollars for a rail line. So and down in the southern end of the Galilee Basin there's a whole range of other mines, Kevin's Corner Alpha. So that test pit that I was showing you is Alpha. Um, and there's Carmichael. Okay, the changes in the price of coal drive major expansions or contractions in the Queensland coal industry as um, you guys, when you graduate, um, probably unlikely that you'll get a job in the coal sector, um, whereas if you graduated 10 years ago, highly likely that you would have been working in the coal industry. So basically what happened was there was a huge spike in 2008 and then the global financial crisis um, then the, it came back up as China spent a huge amount of money to stimulate their economy. So it was China that drove the peaks. And then basically over the last three to four years, coal prices declined massively. So down from $142 to now down around $55 a tonne. And that changes the economics of these mi mines enormously. So in 2008, 2009, miners were crawling over, but would have crawled over barbed wire naked to get a mining lease. But right now, a lot of the mines are just letting them sit, not, not pursuing them. Carmichael is pushing ahead, um, even in the face of a really bad um, financial position. Um, and the outlook for the mining sector is also really bleak because China is basically trying to get away from coal because of their huge pollution problems as quickly as possible. 
um, and renewables are coming through strongly. So the outlook for coal is really bleak. So if you are planning a mine that is going to last for 30 to 60 years and you're planning to make your money back over that time, you know, if you're a banker looking at the situation, would you back it? You have to be crazy. Um, and that's been a lot of news about that and a lot of um, you know, stories. I really like Michael West who writes in the Sydney Morning Herald. He's been exposing a lot about uh, multinational, multinationals and tax avoidance. Um, so companies like Glencore, they pay basically zero on all the money they earn from coal because they, basic, they basically use tax avoidance um, mechanisms to mean that they, they pay no, no income tax in Australia. So Glencore is a massive um, mining company. Adani has the same, same sort of structure. So um, now in terms of context, there's about 50 coal mines in Queensland. Um, the new ones in the, in the Galilee though are massive because, because they're so far from the coast and new, all this new infrastructure has to be built. To justify them, they have to go sort of supersized. Um, to give you context as well, Australia doesn't, is in the top 10 of coal reserves around the world. US, Russia and China have larger coal reserves, but we're, along with Indonesia, the biggest exporters um, of coal because we don't use a lot in our own industries. And so we are really important in setting the global price of coal because we are such large exporters. Um, at the current rate of production, we've got coal, enough coal for about 110 years um, globally. And in Australia, our plan is to dig it all up and burn it. So um, this is from an energy white paper produced a few years ago, and it shows Australia's plan from 2008 through to 2035 when the plan covered. Um, the mustard bar at the bottom is uranium exports, the black is coal, and the red is calcium gas. And you can see that the black and the red are getting bigger. So basically, the plan was to increase our energy exports of coal and calcium gas out to 2035. We're not going to stop there. Basically, our plan is to dig it all up, sell it to someone else. It shows up on their books, and we're not responsible for it. So the idea goes. And um, politicians are completely on board with this. So this is our Premier a couple of years ago, um, Campbell Newman, talking about we're in the coal business. If you want decent hospitals, schools, and police on the beat, we all need to understand that. And um, Labor, the current state government, and the um, coalition government at a federal level back that position entirely. And yet, the coal industry isn't as enormous a sector for the Queensland economy as some people believe, even though it's political dogma. Um, coal only accounts for about 7% of Queensland gross state product. Um, the Queensland government actually earns more from licence registrations than it does from the coal sector, um, and mining another 2%. So that's the context, the problem. Let's go on and talk about what laws regulate this mine. So um, the approval requirements for mining can be confusing, at least to start with. Um, I've put up on the Blackboard site a short reference, which is an extract from a chapter. Um, so don't, I'm going to talk about some sections and the like. I, I really just want you to understand the broad um, issues, the broad tenures, <coughs> issues like what is a mining lease, exploration permit and the like. Um, you can read that chapter f as a general reference. Okay, so um, I've shown you this diagram in the past, so there's many laws that regulate impacts on the environment in Queensland, International Commonwealth Queensland. So we've talked in the past about the Sustainable Planning Act, but m for mining it's mostly at a state level regulated under the Environmental Protection Act and the um, Mineral Resources Act. And at a Commonwealth level, the EPBC Act. Um, but I'll deal with the EPBC Act in Lecture 10. So um, I'm going to focus on land-based laws. So there's a whole set of laws that regulate offshore mining and offshore petroleum extraction. But in Queensland, they're virtually unused because in the 1970s, thankfully, um, our federal government said there can be no exploration for petroleum or mining in the Great Barrier Reef. So basically, virtually the whole of the east coast of Queensland is off limits even to explore for mining or petroleum. So um, we've got offshore laws, but all of our mining and, and coal and gas extraction occur on land. The major laws um, at a state level 
for mining um, in the Mineral Resources Act and the Environmental Protection Act for petroleum, which I'll talk about next week in the context of coal seam gas. It's the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act. And there's also an important act for large projects called the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, which deals with the assessment of large projects and the facilitation of large projects. So within um, Queensland, I've given you this as a handout, um, the major state laws regulating offshore development. Uh, I wanted to break it down in this way just to emphasise a couple of points for you. So if you're in a national park, then mining is prohibited, exploration for mining is prohibited. But that's only well, less than 5% of the state. Outside of national parks, if you're doing anything other than mining or petroleum, then it's virtually certain that you're going to be regulated under the Sustainable Planning Act. So the planning framework that we've looked at, the IDAS system in the last few lectures, that's for if you want to build houses, you want to build an aquaculture facility on land, you want to build a sporting stadium, you want to build a shopping centre, you want to build a house. All of those things are regulated under the Sustainable Planning Act. Everything is regulated under that except for mining and petroleum. So mining and petroleum comes off on this other limb and basically um, tenure and royalties are regulated under the Mineral Resources Act for mining and petroleum and gas act for petroleum and costing gas. So just to explain what that is, tenure is about land ownership and also access to land. So um, our mining system is set up, and it's a fundamental distinction from the planning system. So in the planning framework, if a shopping centre wants to build something on your land, for instance, they have to buy it from you. And if you refuse to sell it to them, they can't force you. If they offer you a billion dollars and you say no, they can't force you to sell to them and they can't develop a shopping centre on your land because you can just say no. However, the mining and petroleum framework is set up to basically be able to overrun objections from landholders and pay them reasonable compensation, but basically people can't object and stop, st stop these projects. So if a cattle property um, owner wants to say no to a miner coming onto their land, basically they can't because the mining system facilitates access for exploration and also access to actually mine and extract the resources. So tenure is important in this system because, yeah, if you're a miner and you want to explore across a huge area, you don't want to go and buy all that land until you know what's there. And if you find a resource and you want to develop it, um, basically the tenure framework allows you to get access to the land and pay the landholder compensation and they can't stop you. So tenure is important. Royalties is basically the money that a miner pays to the state government to buy the resource. So um, it's different from a, t a tax because in our system, the government, the state government, when they sell land or grant land, um, for the last 150 years, they always reserve minerals and petroleum um, to the Crown. So does anyone here own land? Does anyone? Okay, well, you've, who's got parents who've got freehold land? Okay, so that land, um, your parents own it, but the government owns, or the state um, owns, the, any coal or other minerals or, or petroleum on the land. So if um, a, a miner comes along and finds this huge amount of gold or coal on the land, they can apply for a mining lease, it's granted, your parents would get compensation for the loss of use of their land, but they don't get any money for the coal or, or gold that's on their land because the government still owns it. And when the mineral or petroleum is extracted, the miner pays a royalty to the state government. So a royalty is a payment for purchasing the resource from the state government and then the miner can sell it to someone else who wants to burn it or if it's gold or something, do something else with it. So royalties is also something that the state government is really interested in. Separate from environmental issues, 
um, and it has been separated out now. Um, back 20 years ago, it was all dealt with under the same legislation, and then the Environmental Protection Act came along, and um, it was separated out to in theory avoid a conflict of interest for the regulation of environmental issues. They didn't want the same government agencies promoting mining and getting money in as they would be for dealing with environmental issues. I mean, that's the theory. In practice, the Environment Department is completely captured by the mining sector and the political um, emphasis on getting coal and other minerals out of the ground. So the Environment Department struggling for the right words to um, explain how useless they are for environmental issues on mining, but um, you've got, yeah, I'll leave it. Um, so that's some of the approvals. I'm going to go on to talk more about them, um, uh, but let's take a five minute break, hey? Get up, stretch your legs, and we'll come back and we'll jump into the approval requirements for this mine. So, welcome back to the second half of our lecture. We had just been talking through this um, diagram of conceptualising the splits between regulation of non-mining and mining in particular. And I want to go on then to, to look particularly at the applications for a mine. So, there's an offence in the Mineral Resources Act to basically mine, carry out mining without an approval or to, to enter land or prospect or carry out mining operations without approval. So there's an offence, so standard sort of way like the offence for carrying out accessible development without a permit. If you don't have a, um, approval for a mine, it's unlawful. Um, a key thing though in distinguishing what is a mine is a definition of mineral. If you're trying to get a mineral out of the ground, it's mining. If you're trying to get petroleum out of the ground, including coal and gas, then it's petroleum extraction. And that's the key thing that actually splits, causes that split, because if you are operating, say, a quarry for hard rock, which is going to be used for bitumen, so let's just say, you know, hard rock quarry, Brisbane City Council out on Mount Cutha. If you've been out to Mount Cutha, there's a quarry out there. So you're taking rock out of the ground. In that rock, there's going to be minerals. But because the, the use of the material is for rock to be used in, say, road base, it's not regarded as mining. It's regarded as an extractive industry that is dealt with under the planning framework. Similarly, remember we talked about sand mining? and that sand mine up at Pumicestone Passage, if the purpose of the sand is to supply sand for um, cement manufacture, and that's the physical component of it, then it's dealt with under the planning framework. But if you want to get minerals out of the sand, like heavy metals like um, rutile or illuminite or something like that, then it's actually mining because you're going after the minerals. So remember when we talked about use, it was the purpose for which the land was being put. So similarly here, the purpose is important. You could be doing what looks like the same activity with very similar impacts and yet be regulated under two entirely different regimes because of what you're going after. So the definition of mineral is important to understand. Unfortunately, it's a very illogical definition, which you more understand from practicing in the sector than you would from going and looking at the definition. So mineral is defined in section six. So if you're going after a mineral, you're mining. So what is a mineral? A mineral is a substance natural, normally occurring naturally or as part of the Earth's crust. Well, that's bloody everything. Soil, sand, mud, anything dissolved or suspended in water within the Earth's crust or extracted from one of those things. Like bloody anything in the ground. Then subsection two of section six goes on to say each of the following is a mineral. And then in K, it says rock mined in block or slab form for building or monumental purposes. I'll come back to that. Um, but there's a range of other things that are specifically specified, but coal isn't. So if we're thinking about the Carmichael coal mine, they're going after coal. Is it a mineral? Um, coal isn't listed in subsection two. And then you go on to subsection three to say each of the following is not a mineral. 
Soil, sand, gravel or rock, other than rock mentioned in 2K above, that is the rock mined in block or slab form. So soil, sand, gravel or rock, if it is to be used or to be supplied for use as sand, gravel or rock, whether intact or in broken form, which is really confusing, I know, but that's what the definition is. But basically that's where you get the split between um, a sand mine that's going after, sorry, I shouldn't use the term sand mine. If you are an extractive industry going after sand for cement, then you fall into that 3D1 category because you're going after the sand to be used as sand, not for its mineral properties. But if you're going after what's there in the ground to extract, say, a heavy metal from the sand, say rutile, then it doesn't come within that exception and it falls by default. So a lot of things fall out within that 3D1, like a hard rock quarry. If, you, if you're mining, mining again, so you, you naturally use the word mining, but it, these splits mean that, you, that's why we typically call a hard rock quarry an extractive industry rather than a rock mine. Um, so extractive industry is the term that you generally use in, you'll see in planning schemes. They won't refer to a mine because it's a confusion between the two separate systems. So I know that's confusing. You more understand it from practice. And if you're practicing in the sector, everyone knows that coal is a mineral um, within the Mineral Resources Act and therefore you need a mining lease for it. And similarly gold and diamonds or something like that, you're going after them. They're called minerals. Um, that rock mined in slab form, so remember 2K, rock mined in slab, block or slab form for building or monumental purposes. We've got a great example of that. You might have walked through it on the way to this lecture. So the Great Court, sandstone is rock, it's sandstone, mined in block um, for building or monumental purposes. So. Um, this, the sandstone in the Great Court mainly comes from the Hellerton Hills, which is a couple of hours um, northwest of Brisbane. And I was involved years ago in a objection to a sandstone mine, yeah, sandstone mine. And it comes within the definition of mineral. It's not a particularly logical separation. It's, it's just not logical, but it's there. So, a sandstone mine is dealt with under the mineral resources framework. Um, but if you were to mine exactly the same thing and break it up to use for broken for, you know, road manufacture or something, it would be under the planning framework. So if it's mined for that purpose, then it's under the minerals framework. Um, now even um, possibly more illogical is if you actually look at the definition of minerals, we're thinking about coal. Mineral is, if you're looking at it in geological terms, mineral is normally defined by criteria like it's naturally occurring, stable at room temperature, represented by a chemical formula, usually abiogenic, that is not resulting from the activity of living organisms, and it has an ordered atomic arrangement. Um, so these are minerals. There's about one, over 4,900 known mineral species. Um, there's been some proposals to include um, a wider definition of mineral, um, but um, basically um, coal doesn't come within the, the normal definition of mineral, the geological definition of mineral, because it comes from, you know, coal comes from um, biotic processes, originally plants that, you know, black coal in Queensland formed during the Carboniferous period about 250 million years ago, has been pressure and heat over time, have forced out all the water, it's been crushed and metamorphized as, um, or crushed basically to coal. Um, so that's what formed it. It's originally got a plant source, even though there's metamorphic processes involved. Um, it generally wouldn't be regarded as a mineral in geological terms, but it's certainly regarded as a mineral within the Mineral Resources Act. So, um, yeah, coal, um, if you look at the definition, um, mineral of fossil fossilised carbon, it's a sedimentary rock 
um, harder forms such as anthracite um, can be regarded as a metamorphic rock because of their exposure to elevated temperature and pressure. Um, and Talitha Santini, if any of you have come across her, she's with the, our school, um, looks after environmental management and mining stream. And I asked her just to con confirm this, because I'd worked in the sector for years and I always just assumed coal was a mineral. And then something triggered me thinking about it a couple of years ago and I thought, this is really strange. Why do we, I've just always assumed coal was a mineral because I didn't have a geologic background. I asked T Talitha and she said, yep, coal isn't a mineral strictly speaking, but under a lot of reporting arrangements, um, it is regarded as a mineral um, uh, or, yeah, resources. So despite coal arguably not being a mineral in a strict technical sense, in a legal sense, it's clear that coal is included as a mineral under the Mineral Resources Act. So for the Adani coal mine, they're going after a mineral, even though that's not technically correct, but it is legally correct, that's what they're doing. Um, but, um, yeah, there's numerous references to coal and calcium gas in the Mineral Resources Act. So, let's look at the tenures. And in the Mineral Resources Act, you'll find a number of different tenures, and again, they can be confusing. So I just want to unpack them a little bit. Um, there's some low-level permits for small-scale mining, although there's even a definition of small-scale mining, a technical definition, so I want to avoid that term. Um, we can call it artisanal or hobby mine tenures. So in a lot of, not really that important anymore in Australia because normally our mines are big, but particularly in places like Brazil, you have lots of people just, you know, go out into the bush, you know, dig, a, dig in looking for gold or something like that. You know, they've got a pick, they build the structure, they dig into the ground. You could call that artisanal mining. Um, so um, you need a prospecting permit um, to hand mine for minerals or prospect for minerals. Um, excluding coal, that is, uh, or a mining claim if you're actually you're carrying out small-scale operations with limited use of machinery. So a pick, for instance, you're digging for gold, you need a mining claim um, because if you find any, the gold actually belongs to the government and you've got to pay them a royalty for the extraction of it. So they're small, the smaller mines. Um, fossicking license as well. If someone goes out, you know, they're panning for gold, technically they need a fossicking license. But that's all small-scale stuff. Our mine, Carmichael, is so massive, those are just, you know, not even anywhere near it. For large mines, the tenures are an exploration permit, a mineral development license, and a mining lease. And I'll just explain the differences. So an exploration permit is what you get to go and explore for a mineral, typically across a large area. And it gives you two big advantages. One, it gives you access to the land if you want to drill or do something like that, and a landholder can't stop you. Um, the second thing it gives you is it protects you from someone else coming. If you spend millions of dollars, you know, exploring and then you find a mineral, someone else hears about it, they can't rush in and lodge a um, mining lease application before you and be granted it. So you can exclude others um, from basically applying for a mining lease within your exploration permit area. So valuable for you as a miner for a number of reasons. But obviously less impacts. Um, a mineral development license is if you find something that's not yet worth mining, you can establish a holding pattern basically where you're not actually mining but other people can't apply for a mining lease and that's called a mineral, mineral development license. So basically you're holding it, you found something but it's not yet economic. If you want to actually go to extraction and sale, full blown mine, then you need a mining lease. So it's the mining lease is the big tenure. Um, so, just unpack that a little bit. So, exploration, you might be doing something like this. You've got a drilling rig here. This is um, exploration drilling, drilling for the Wondoan coal mine. It's on an existing cattle property. You can see the drill rig there. They pull out a core, and here's just part of the core. You can see the coal and the different layers. So, they've drilled down, um, say, 20, 30 metres, even down, you know, 100, 150 metres and pull out what's there and basically they log what's there and you work out how big your coal is, you can sample it, you know, work out coal quality and those sorts of things. So here's just another image um, of that from the Galilee Basin. Okay, um, also included in exploration might be um, a test pit. So this was for the Wondoan coal mine for bulk sampling. So they 
uh, at a place where the coal was quite close to the surface, they took off the um, um, overburden and then took out some of the coal and then shipped it over to a power station to test for burning. So it's still in the exploration phase, but it looks like a mine, doesn't it? But it's still in the exploration phase. Um, and similarly, in the Alpha mine, you often see this picture in um, images about mines in the Galilee. It's actually in the Galilee Basin, but it's only at part of the exploration stage for the Alpha coal mine. It's, um, the actual mine would be 100, 200 times bigger than this. So this was a, a pit where they basically dug down, and this is in the pit. You can see the coal. Do you have a question? So that's a really good question. If that land was owned by a farmer, would they have no way to stop it? That's correct. Basically, um, if an exploration permit is granted, you farmers can't stop it. That's the whole thing with the lock the gate and why it's so controversial, because the gas companies can lawfully come onto their land. You know, they've got to give notice, they've got to there's certain things they've got to do to you know, they can't just walk on and you know, go right up to a house and start drilling beside a house. There's, there are limits, but on a large cattle property, yeah, you can't stop them pretty well. Yeah, you've got a question? So, so that has a native title or a native title? Yeah, native title is another issue, um, but for exploration particularly, it doesn't, it's more the stage of getting the mining lease, so that um, fight that Adrian Burgubber and his, and his people are having is in relation to the grant of the mining lease. And we'll talk a little bit more about native title in a later lecture, but basically the native title framework allows for an indigenous land use agreement to be set up, which is basically where the mining company bribes the local people with money and jobs and um, basically the, the peoples agree to an Iliwa and they basically get paid compensation effectively, the same as the landholder. So an Iliwa, uh, is it, it, the nice term would be a compensation agreement for damage to native title. The other term would be a bribe. Um, so, and basically there's been a big fight within the group, the um, uh, Wangan and Jagalingu peoples, the Bur Burugabas, um people. Um, there's some people that want the mine and Adrian's been fighting, you know, to basically bring the group together and oppose it. And there had been an Ilya agreed and then they basically said, no, we don't. So he's tried to rip it up and it's, it's all in the federal court about a whole range of stuff, but it's a long drawn out fight and yeah. And often within the um, uh, traditional owners, there can be splinter, you know, it's not a homogenous group often and people have different interests. So it's hard. Um, anyway, that's still exploration um, stage, but you can see coal there. Um, okay, so under major rights under an exploration permit, I don't, I've summarised them already. There's a lot of text there, but the basic thing I want you to take away, exploration, you can go in and explore, uh, but you can't actually pull out the coal for sale. Um, and you've got to apply for an exploration permit. So Adani had to apply for an exploration permit to go in and drill holes all over the Carmichael mine. They drilled hundreds, testing the coal, carrying out seismic testing and the like. Um, and yeah, so you've got to apply for that. And then you go on, if you find a resource, you go on to a full-blown mine. So this is that same image I put up before. This is a full-blown open-cut open -cut coal mine. And you've got to apply for the mining lease before you do that. So again, I, I don't want to, you to worry about the, you know, the, the lot of text there. I'm just saying to you that there is a application process for a mining lease. And what it actually allows you to do is take the coal out of the ground on a large scale and sell it. And basically the holder of a mining lease basically has a right to mine the land. That's the essential thing. Um, and pay, they've got to pay royalties to the state government for the resource. Now the application process for a mining lease is much more uh, involved than the application for the exploration permit. There are objection rights. Um, so um, again, don't need to worry about the detail of um, these sections, just there's an application for a mining lease. People can object and objections can go basically to land court 
they, they rarely go to, um, objections rarely occur for mines, um, basically because mines go in and basically pay compensation, pay out all of the um, landholders are involved and it's occurring out in remote areas so you don't have, um, you know, large scale objections generally. Um, so that's mining, uh, sorry, that's the mining tenures and royalties regime. Um, the miners also require an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act and this is where the primary um, requirements for environmental protection are found. I could download the Environmental Protection Act and skim through it like we did for the Sustainable Planning Act, but I, I don't want to do that. I'll come back to the Environmental Protection Act in a couple of lectures time. We'll talk about coal seam gas next week and then the Environmental Protection Act the week after in the context of environmental harm. But if I just um, explain to you that until 2013, the Environmental Protection Act had a structure like this. So if we went through the, the um, chapter headings, and the Environmental Protection Act, when, when I first graduated um, a long time ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, um, the Environmental Protection Act was a really small piece of legislation and really quite logical. I really liked it. It was logical and it, it worked well. well. Well, it read well. Probably didn't work any better than it works now because it's always been um, huge discretion to allow a lot of environmental destruction under it. But it was lo logical to read. And then in 1997, it was integrated into the IDAS system. And then in 2000, it was also majorly changed to in increase the um, regulation of mining. And now in 2013, it also, was also majorly changed for some changes that the LNP brought through. Um, so if you think about the structure of the Environmental Protection Act, if you were to download and read it, a good analogy is, imagine you had a book, a book that you really liked, um, or actually just make it a book that you've never read. Um, and now you rip the spine off and rip up every page, and then you throw those pages in the air and they all come down and you bundle them all up into a big pile and then, you know, get them into a, like a, and then you staple them <laughs> together so that pages are in just a random order and some of them are upside down and some of them are back to front you would have an approximation of this, what's happened to the Environmental Protection Act over the last 20 years because the structure is about as logical as that. Um, might, I might be exaggerating a little bit there, but um, uh, basically until 2013, there were some chapters that dealt with development approvals under IDAS in chapter four, um, and then there was chapter five dealt with mining approvals, chapter 5A dealt with coal seam gas and greenhouse gas storage and that sort of stuff, and then there other chapters. Um, and then after 2013, chapter four disappeared completely. Um, there's no chapter six. And those chapters got merged into chapter five. So now, if you look at the act, um, you'd see general offense provisions you know, it's, a, it's an offence to carry out an environmentally relevant activity um, without an authority. And environmentally relevant activity includes um, B, a resource activity. And it may also be prescribed under regulations in the 64 that are prescribed, um, including things like aquaculture. So for your development proposal, if you're, pro if you're considering something like aquaculture, go and have a look at the EP regulations. But for minerals, um, resource activity includes geothermal, greenhouse gas storage, mining or petroleum activities. So um, these are all resource activities and therefore um, environmentally relevant activities under the Environmental Protection Act. You need an environmental authority to carry them out. And um, yeah, I mentioned the prescribed ERAs are listed in Schedule 2 of the regulations and include things like aquaculture. So um, our mine is, well, Carmichael Coal Mine is a mining activity. It needs an environmental authority. Um, and it would be an offence to carry it out without it. So um, Adani needed one. Um, 
There's some definitions in it of like small scale mining. So it's carried out under an exploration permit, et cetera. It's got a long definition. It's not within one kilometre of a category A environmentally sensitive area. It's not in strategic cropping land range of things, but we're not that. We're massively outside small scale mining activity. Um, the new chapter five covers all environmental authorities after 2013. And it looks very similar to IDAS. There's an application stage, an information stage, a notification stage, and a decision stage. So very similar to IDAS. Um, it's overall a lot simpler because you don't have to look at things like planning schemes if you're assessing a mine. You just go through the process. It's actually a hell of a lot simpler than the IDAS system because you don't have detailed planning schemes. You've just got basically a process with some vague criteria at the end and that's it. But at least on paper, it looks similar to IDAS. Um, there's three types of ERA applications standard, um, which is basically where you meet a range of criteria and which limit the, have limited impacts. Um, relative, they're generally low risk activities. I won't go through the criteria in detail, but basically they're not publicly notified. They're low risk mining activities. Um, you can apply for a standard application. There's also variation applications where you meet the elig eligibility criteria, but you need to change some of the standard conditions. So they're two minor applications, but pretty well anything else requires a site-specific application. That's what they're called under the legislation. So for Carmichael, we need, it needed a site-specific application, which then goes through public objections and um, yeah. Now, for big projects, they typically go to an entity called the Coordinator General, which um, is a male, has always been a male. There's never, I don't think there's ever been a female Coordinator General. Um, it's, um, yep, need to, uh, we, uh, Coordinated Projects, basically, the Coordinator General is there, has been there since the 70s. And basically the Coordinator General is, exists under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. The Coordinator General can call, basically declare something to be a coordinated project. Until 2012 they were called significant projects, but now they're called coordinated projects. And basically that means that the Coordinator General is there to facilitate the, the project through um, the approval processes at the state level. So generally it's only the big projects um, that are made coordinated projects and basically from an applicant's perspective is you've got a, a mate in government who's in there to fight for you, basically a bully. Um, I remember years ago I was acting for a big developer and they were having a lot of problems. The minister at the time was the local member and hated the project and the fisheries department didn't like the fact that we wanted to cover in a whole heap of mangroves and, and I remember this um, one of the managers from the company sat back at one stage and he said, because it hadn't been declared a coordinated project, and there was some swearing, so I'll include the swearing, sorry. Um, and he said, you know, I've just got one question. When do we, um, does, does anyone know um, a good um, uh, project officer with um, the DSD, Department of State Development at the time, who can kick these, uh, you know, kick the Environment Department and Fisheries into line. Um, and basically we had this, there was a conversation about, you know, I didn't know anyone who could do it, but basically the attitude was um, get the Coordinator General involved, get them to go and kick Fisheries and um, Environmental Protection Agency up the backside, get them out of the way of the project, because it was a big um, canal estate, a lot of money involved, um, and basically, yeah. Um, in government there's a pecking order, so Treasury, Premier's at the top, Coordinator General very high up, and then basically go down the other government departments. Environment has always been basically near the bottom. Um, fisheries generally also very low. So basically Coordinator General goes in, pushes them all, all into line. If it's a significant project, the Coordinator General is also responsible for the environmental impact assessment. So I just want to look at environmental impact assessment briefly. So EIA refers to any process used by decision makers to assess the environmental impacts of a project. It's formal EIA is widespread around the world. The most common form is called environmental impact statement. Um, it was first used in the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969 in the US. And that term has been widely used 
in many countries, including Australia. But EIS is just one form of environmental impact assessment. So the purpose of EIA is to inform decision makers about the true environmental impacts. Um, in Queensland, there's a number of um, um, EIA processes. I've summarised them on a handout I've given you. I've given you so under the Sustainable Planning Act, there's like information request process, there's a notification process. Um, those things are all forms of environmental impact assessment, but they're not called an EIS. For mining, um, at a national level, there's the EPBC Act. At a state level, they require approval under the Environmental Protection Act and the Mineral Resources Act. There is an EIS process under the Environmental Protection Act, but generally any large project is made a coordinated project and the EIS process in the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act is used. So um, I've given you this on a handout. So basically the proponent prepares an initial advice statement which says we're going to earn the state a lot of money, make us a coordinated project. Coordinated General declares it a coordinated project and then it goes through terms of reference, an EIS is prepared and then generally there's a supplementary EIS after public notifications. So you have the EIS and the SEIS as it's often called. And then there's a Coordinated General's report which invariably says gives it the thumbs up. So that's what happened with Carmichael. There was an EIS prepared under the State Development Act. Now the basic process for mines sounds fairly simple. There's an application, there's an EIS or other assessment, objection period, objections can go to the land court, ministerial approvals. It looks simple. I've put this up on Blackboard site. I didn't want to print it out, but basically there's a lot of boxes here. I know you can't read the text, but basically this is the Alpha Coal Mine and all of the steps in the EIS process from 2008 through to 2016, and it still doesn't have its mining lease. So nearly 10 years. And basically for the last few years, obviously Hancock, the miner, has just been saying to the state government, don't give us a mining lease, because it's not economic for us to go ahead. That's why it's taken them several years, um, longer than what might have been expected. But basically there's many steps. It can take years. It's not a simple process. Okay, um, I want to... I'll actually talk about Regional Planning Interest Act, I think, first. Um, how are mines assessed? Um, so the criteria for mines are very vague. Um, you can pretty well drive a truck through them. Um, so there's criteria for deciding a mining lease application. 269, subsection 4 of the Mineral Resources Act set out things like um, the area is mineralised, the area applied for is appropriate, the term sort is appropriate, and then there's some criteria like J, they w um, that the, they must consider whether there will be any adverse environmental impact caused by those operations, and if so, the extent thereof. So you consider environmental impacts, and you basically weigh them against the money that the state will earn, but there's no extent of environmental impacts that is unacceptable. It's just basically got to be, we've got to get enough money to justify the environmental destruction. And similarly, under the Environmental Protection Act, even though it's got objectives like ecologically sustainable development and obligations to achieve that objective, in practice the criteria are also very vague. There's a reference to considering the standard criteria. So if you look at the standard criteria, there's principles like ESD, um, but there's no cut and dry point where environmental impacts are actually unacceptable. Again, money, can buy its way into justifying a lot of um, uh, environmental damage. It's virtually unheard of for mines to be refused. It can happen, rarely happens. This is one, in fact, refused by um, Jeff Sini, and he was the um, Minister for State Development at the time, a bauxite mine in Cape York um, that had some concerns from the traditional owners. Um, that's you've got more chance, I'd say you've got more chance of being hit by a low-flying plane than you have of having a mining lease application refused in Queensland. So it's virtually unheard of. Um, in response to concerns from farmers about mining and coal seam gas, um, intruding on good quality agricultural land, a few years ago the Regional Planning Interest Act was created, which set up protection for priority agricultural areas and strategic cropping areas particularly, and also towns. Environmental areas in theory, but in practice, not really. Um, so that exists. Carmichael isn't affected by that, but I just mentioned it. 
I just want to wrap up um, talking to, wrap, to answer our key questions. Does the proposed Carmichael mine, Carmichael mine need any approvals to comply with, the, comply with the law? You betcha. And are those approvals likely to be granted? You betcha as well. So you've got, yeah. While decisions on approvals for coal mines in theory prohibit decisions that are not consistent with ESD, in practice they involve weighing up broad considerations of jobs and economic benefits versus adverse social and environmental impacts. And so in this weighing up process, jobs and, and, and economics typically trump other considerations. That's just the cold, hard reality of yeah, our political and legal system. Um, there is an overarching duty to achieve ESD in the Environmental Protection Act and, and in the decision we got from the Land Court about Carmichael, the judge acknowledged it. She then didn't mention it anywhere further in her decision, but she did say that she thought she had to consider whether it achieved ESD. But you see the real political imperative um, in this statement from the Premier at the time. Um, jobs and economics trump social and, and environmental impacts. We're in the coal business. It's really clear. Um, a fellow called Guy Pearce, not the actor, um, an author, wrote a book a few years, or this was, he wrote a book um, called High and Dry, and then he wrote this essay called Quarry Vision, which is a really good metaphor for how politically we see Australia, which is basically this big quarry, we're gonna dig everything up and sell it, and that's how we make our money. I don't agree with that. Um, I, yep, we're in the coal business, but um, we need to rethink that um, because it's just not, there's no future in it. So it's been his, important historically, but it's not consistent with protecting the Great Barrier Reef now. We need to move away from it. So I just want to mention the impacts of the mine and postscript. So groundwater, black-throated finch, climate change, economics were all issues in this court case. Um, you can read about it on my website, as I said. In the court case, Adani suffered a major public relations blow because their own economists said that their claim was basically distorted. Rather than 10,000 jobs, it was only about 1,400, less than 15% of the original claim, and rather than 22 billion, royalties would be between four and five billion in net present value, so about 20% of the original claim. If you think about that, in terms of the weighing the environmental damage versus the jobs and um, money, you can see that the jobs and money have just deflated a huge amount. But you can see why the miner would inflate them because that's the positive of the mine. Um, the land court recommended the environmental authority and mining lease be granted and that's what occurred on Sunday. There's still ongoing court cases. One court case I've invited you to um, about the um, Commonwealth approval. There's also a federal court challenge to the native title issues. One of the many problems, I think, with the judgment is how it treats um, greenhouse gases. It basically says, um, if the coal doesn't come from here, it will come from somewhere else in the world. Therefore, there will be no impact on climate change. So um, until the court case, during the EIS, everyone had ignored the burning of the coal. So they only focused on the scope one and two emissions and completely ignored the burning of the coal. Now, the court's findings are incredulous, is the mine will be one of the largest mines in the world. It'll have a material effect on global coal supply, price and consumption. This mine will increase global thermal coal supply by between four and 6%. Now, if you apply ordinary economics, um, you'd, that would lead to an increase in consumption and therefore increase greenhouse gases. The court's reasoning, if it's lawful, and this is one of the things that's been challenged in one of the court cases um, that you can come to later in the semester about alpha. Um, if it's lawful though, it leaves the object of the Environmental Protection Act of achieving ESD in tatters. Um, it would also shred criminal liability if you applied it to drug dealing or contract killing because you could, the contract killer could always say, oh, if I didn't do it, someone else would. Drug dealer could always say, if I didn't sell them the drugs, someone else would, okay? So if any of you guys, ever get charged with drug dealing, don't try that defence. I'm not going to really wash very well with the police and courts aren't going to appreciate it either. But if you want to sell coal, it's very good defence, at least at this stage. So the subtext, I think, of this appeal in the Alpha case is basically how weak is our environmental protection aid? Is it worth the paper it's written on? Um, 
There's also on my website a case study about litigation under the federal laws. Um, I won't dwell on that, but yeah, there's a, a judicial review hearing um, in the federal court on the 3rd, 4th of May that you're welcome to come to. Um, and yeah, at a federal level, our, it's, our judicial review case is all focused on climate change. Our federal environment minister, Greg Hunt, basically treated greenhouse gas emissions in a similar way. He acknowledged them, scope three emissions in his statement of reasons, but then found that he didn't really know because of other sources where the coal would come from, what might be the impact, and therefore he went on to approve the mine. So basically, yeah, he acknowledged it, but said it might come from somewhere else, therefore approve it. Now, in spite of what the Queensland and Commonwealth governments have done in terms of supporting the mine, the real problem for the mine is economics. It's not anything to do with the approval process. It's the fact that coal price is so low that the mine just doesn't seem viable. Um, even one of the experts for the mine, this is their own expert <coughs> on economics, um, in the court case last year said, this is an extremely risky project. Everyone knows that. I admit that. Can you imagine paying that money? paying that guy money to act, you know, as your economic expert, and that's the evidence he gives. That's their own economic expert. Um, and you can go out and buy a coal mine at the moment for a buck. Isaac Plains sold last year for one dollar, a working coal mine, sold for a buck. So why would you spend 16 billion on new infrastructure and a new coal mine? I mean, and the wider context of these approvals is we've got a disaster unfolding on the Great Barrier Reef and we're looking to approve one of the biggest coal mines in the world. It's crazy. We're seeing severe impacts on the reef even now. We have no reason to expect that it's going to survive if we continue and increase emissions. So basically we're looking at a future for the reef like what's in the middle or on the right hand side of those images. Now if you don't feel angry about this, then yeah. I just think it's, you should feel, it's right to feel angry and horrified about our complicity in this because it's happening and we've known it's going to happen for 20 years um, since, yeah. Um, so people like this, this is Charlie Vernon, a coral reef expert, said decision on the coal mine defies reason. He was talking about coral reef inspects. This is just from a few days ago in the City Morning Herald. And I think of this story I saw last year in, um, it was about a fellow who was charged in Germany with being the bookkeeper for Auschwitz and he was charged with um, complicity for genocide um, and he was convicted. And when I see Greg Hunt's, you know, accounting for um, greenhouse gases and then approving it, <coughs> I think that our approach to environmental impact assessment is pretty similar. We account for the people going into the gas chambers and then we close the door. So, on that note. Um, let's wrap up. Today's lecture looked at the Carmichael coal mine. I hope I've left you horrified and angry. Um, and we've looked at the system that supported it. Further reading, you can look at the website. You can also read the summary of laws. Um, in terms of take home points, approval of the Carmichael coal mine highlights systematic failure of our governments and our legal system to protect us. It's right to feel angry and horrified. And then I've listed here some other technical points about mining isn't dealt with under SPA, definitions of mineral and petroleum are important, there's different regimes at a state level for tenure and royalties, etc. Um, and there's a number of different statutory processes for uh, environmental impact assessment in Queensland. Um, finally, approvals for mine mines involve weighing up broad considerations of jobs and economic benefits versus adverse social and environmental impacts. And in this process, jobs and economics typically trump other considerations. So that's the lecture. Thanks, guys.